Thank you so much for joining us for this very special edition of All Angles. I'm Dion Jacks Miller. We're on location at Up Park Camp, the home of the Jamaica Defence Force, for a special one-on-one -on -one interview with the outgoing Chief of Defence Staff, Lieutenant General Rocky Mead. Let me start out with an issue that's very much in the news, which is COVID and so-called vaccine mandates, because we've started to see employers in the private sector require them, their employees to take the vaccine or else provide weekly tests. And the JDF came out on this very, very early and said, if I'm correct, that you're encouraging members of the force to take the vaccine, but not mandating it. Is that correct? Thank you very much for the opportunity to interact with you today. And that's a very important issue for us to start on. So the JDF's position is that we must be prepared to protect ourselves so that we are as fully fit and capable as possible to help protect the citizens of Jamaica. We have a policy where we will not take punitive action, that is disciplinary action against persons who choose not to take the vaccine, but there are administrative implications. That is, I have a right to determine who I employ where in order not to put other service persons at risk and not to put the citizens at risk. And one of the most important considerations is my selection of leaders. So obviously, if I'm trying to encourage the troops to take the vaccine so I can best protect the citizens, then I need leaders who can themselves motivate the troops to um, you know, take the vaccine and therefore I consider the decision of my service members in terms of their own vaccine status in determining who may be assigned leadership roles. Okay, so in other words, it's kind of like a backdoor mandatory policy, right? Where people know, okay, you won't get fired, but you won't get promoted. So there is a very big, there may not be a stick, but there is a very big carrot. I, I think that's a reasonable assessment in that uh, a big carrot is a good way to look at it in that there is motivation. Leadership is all about motivation and we're trying to motivate the troops and I need my subordinate leaders to help me motivate the troops. And so yes, that would be a, a reasonable analysis. What about incoming members of the force? So those mm. have to be vaccinated? Yes. So we have always had a policy of vaccination for persons joining us. As you know, there are several vaccines already mandated um, you know, to, to ensure that people are, are fit and able to function in our environment. And so we would seek to ensure that persons join our ranks are persons who, do, who would want to be fully protected so that we can help protect our citizens. There is a question that's been discussed over and over, but I think it's worth revisiting, especially mm -hmm. speaking to somebody like you. In 2021, why does Jamaica need a JD, a military arm of the state? Mm -hmm. I would say that in 2021, we need to consider very carefully uh, the tremendous value that the Jamaica Defense Force can bring. So we have taken an approach that while militaries are normally focused on defense, that in a small island developing state, uh, we can't afford to have the military focused entirely on defense. Meaning external so, threats. When right. you say defense. That's right. So we have taken approach, we have a doctrine of what we call ownership and flexibility where we must be masters of the craft of defense and you know traditional defense to traditional uh, threats but that we must be flexible enough to realize that we have to be a part of nation building we have to be a part of looking at what are the real challenges that face jamaica and we are a part of that solution if you think about it the Jamaica Defence Force is the only organisation, and this is just a matter of fact, that whatever challenges the country face, they can turn to the JDF, either to deal exclusively with the problem or to support other agencies that have that responsibility as their primary responsibility. You have seen, for example, in the COVID-19 response, 
that the main responsibility is the Ministry of Health and Wellness, but that the JDF is one of the main organizations actively supporting that effort. Um, you know in terms of disaster response, we are actively there. We are looking also at the future of the country and a mandate we have set ourselves of helping to change the culture of violence in Jamaica, which is a part of our long-term strategy, and we're doing youth engagement to achieve that. So I think that it may be short-sighted if anyone at this time is questioning the relevance of the Jamaica Defence Force, because the, we are looking way beyond just the mandate of defence, which is still very important, and looking how we can assist with national development and helping the country and other agencies resolve other challenges facing the country. And a big part of that resolution of other challenges is crime fighting, correct? Because the JDF is now an active participant in the crime fighting process. Indeed. All right. Now, you got some flack for some comments you made sure. recently, and let me just quote some of them. You are mm -hmm. speaking with the media, you are speaking about rights issues, and you said, we don't seem to understand the right to life should supersede all other rights. We do not have an appetite to forego temporarily some of our rights in order to secure the right to life. We have some of our citizens, whether unwittingly or deliberately, encouraging, encouraging or facilitating those who are violence producers. We have a justice system that facilitates what you could argue are inadequate sentences. And uh, as I mentioned, you got a bit of flack. Um, Horace Levy, the sociologist from Peace Management in Initiative, suggested that you instead call the Prime Minister's attention to the limits of your expertise and point him towards the problems caused by social decay. The glean an edit in an editorial entitled No to Usurpation of Fundamental Rights pointed to the disappearance of thousands of people in Argentina at a time when the military was in charge, saying this is what happens when people make moral compromises ostensibly in exchange for national security and said usually it's the men in uniform, like yourself, who make the case for this trade-off. So, first of all, how do you respond to the criticisms? I think the criticisms are important. I think I'm, as wait, I'm waiting for the bot here now. No, no, not at all. I think as a part of dialogue in a liberal democracy, we need debate, we need criticisms. No one is above criticism, and especially not um, um, employees of the state. It, it is very, very important. I think, however, it is useful to have dialogue that targets the argument and not the personality. I think it's also useful to have dialogue that does not necessarily exaggerate a position and attack the exaggeration. I am you're quite- say, You're saying your position was exaggerated? There may be instances where there's an exaggeration and then the exaggeration is attacked. Wh which so, of the sentences I read would he have said was an exaggeration? Well, no, not the sentences okay, you have read. Because those were but, direct quotes. But the inter no, so the interpretation. So a quote might be made and then an inference is made from the quote and then the inference is attacked. So, but let's go to the point of expertise. I claim no expertise except maybe to say that I've had extensive training in critical thinking and strategic leadership. Um, I've had extensive training, I've had extensive experience, uh, but you know, to claim to be an expert, you not only need to have training and practice, you need to keep yourself current with the literature. And um, so I'd be very cautious about those who claim expertise, and I claim no expertise except to outline the training that I've had. With respect to the issue of uh, human rights, again, that's one point that we could wonder if there may be an exaggeration and the exaggeration attacked. Well, I'll so, tell, you what, tell me what is your position and then right. we'll know whether it's been exaggerated. Good. So the point about the primacy of the right to life is not something that I conjured up. We can look at how our own constitution is worded 
we can look at the Charter of Rights in our own constitution, we can look at the United Nations Charter on Rights, and we can see that it's not by accident, in my humble opinion. And let me emphasize, I am not a constitutional expert, I'm not a legal expert. But to the extent that I can read the various uh, laws and documents that exist, there seem to be already established and stated in a number of fora the, the thought that there's some primacy to the right to life. Our very own constitution requires the state to have mechanisms to protect citizens from other citizens who may want to do them harm. And the Constitution provides for the possibility that the state may need to temporarily impact some rights of citizens, such as freedom of movement and so on, in order to protect other citizens. This is in our Constitution. So when I seek to point this out, I am not seeking to suggest that anything be done in excess of what the Constitution uh, provides. Let's go to the break. When we come back, we continue my interview with Lieutenant General Rocky Meade.